Hello and welcome. My name is Emily Cooper and as part of my residency with the Regional Cultural Centre, I've decided to do a series of recorded conversations with people I've been working with over the last year. Um, the theme of the, of the conversations is uh, a conversation you might have with your friends and your colleagues after a literary event. So uh, with that in mind, I'd like to introduce Joe Burns who is a poet from Northern Ireland, who's currently living in Germany, who has been working with me on a collection called The Conversation. So. Hi, Emily. Welcome. <laughs> Hi. So um, we kind of have an interesting background. Um, yeah. We have never met in person, but we've been working together for about two years now. Um, yeah. And I think the way that we met is quite an interesting story. Um, so yeah, I was I was I was thinking about that this morning, and I I remembered how it was. I wrote a poem about studying dentistry, that was published in Banshee a few years ago, well, maybe four or five years ago now, and um, it was all about studying dentistry and knowing that I was in the completely wrong job, and. Um, and then I think we, you managed that you picked this up on Twitter or something and contacted me. Yeah. Yeah. I thought it was so. kind of funny because, um, turns out, well, I studied dentistry as well, mm -hmm. um, and didn't make it through to the end. I think you made it through further than I did though. A little bit further, but still. <laughs> Too far. I did three, I did three years and you did what, four years? Or I did four, four, four and a half. Four and a half. Four and a half. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so it's um, that's all a long time ago. Obviously, we both studied in Glasgow, didn't we? So the yeah. same place as well. Um, so it was so strange, like whenever you, you find a coincidence like that and then yeah. you find more. Also, uh, reading Ghost in the Throat by Adrian Agrippa, she also studied dentistry for years. So there must be something in, in the movement from... Well, I, you know, there's, yeah, obviously as a dentist, you're looking deep into things and <laughs> drilling for the truth, I guess. But <laughs> yeah, there's something like you could, you could attach like some kind of metaphor into like the mouth and speech and all this stuff. But I don't, mm. yeah, I don't think I went into dentistry with like noble intentions so much as I was just trying to please my family. <laughs> well, I mean, look, it, it's it's a hundred percent the same here. It's one of those one of those things I internalized. I think at the age of sixteen, you know, a a good, stable, well paying job. Yeah, that, you know, job for a woman, manageable with kids, etc. It just um, plus uh, there's a there's a few dentists in my family, so it it was kind of something that felt like the right thing to do but I never thought about it I was far too young to be making life decisions so yeah I felt like that as well um so we worked out that we were both studied dentistry in Glasgow and then we realized that we were writing on quite similar subjects as well yeah. um similar preoccupations and we came across the idea or the mutual interest that we have in muses mm -hmm. yeah. yeah that's right that's right I think uh, were we both in the same issue of Stinging Fly, the Stinging Fly or something? I had a poem about Dora Maar and then we worked out that connection as well. You sent me a piece you'd written about Dora Maar and the muses and, and that was really it. The connection has been there oh, since. The very funny coincidence. Um, so we sort of, from that we were like chatting and then I don't even know how we started writing the poems. It was like, you, you sort of, like a lot of times you talk to people and you'd be like we should do something together we should write mm -hmm. something but we actually did it like, yeah it was i don't amazing even, thing. i don't even remember whose idea it was i think we joked a few years back on twitter about writing a collection about dentistry together <laughs> and then that, like, that one i think we went down a better avenue <laughs> yeah, so, yeah and then i don't know it was what Autumn 2019, winter 2019, we kind of started bouncing stuff back and forward um, before before COVID hit. <laughs> yeah, we had loads of plans of meeting up and stuff. It never, never came to fruition. Even like last year, we were supposed to meet in Paris. Yeah. But uh, we've had, the world has been against us meeting. I know, I know. Work, but it's 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 just serendipity. It's waiting for the right time for us to yeah. meet Emily. <laughs> it's gonna be great when it happens. But uh, yeah. <laughs> so basically we started writing um this collaborative collection, which 
uh, we emailed back and forth. So we would do a poem and send it to the other person and send mm -hmm. it back. Um, but I think we should, uh, we should tell, well, tell me first of all, how you became interested in muses. Um, I'll try and keep this like, not, I'll not try not to go into the whole story, but, um, a combination of things. Firstly, I suppose, um, being a mother of three young children. I think a lot of, a lot of, at the, for many years, I mean, they're, they're all pretty much grown up now, but um, you do tend to lose yourself a bit and, and feel unseen, um, you know, and all your hobbies and interests and passions, um, career, etc. I kind of felt like um, I wasn't seen anymore outside of this role as mother, wife, etc. Around the same time, um, I happened to be in a Picasso museum um, where they had an exhibition of sketches of, I mean, 70, 80 different sketches of the same bull. Yeah. Um, and and I, I found it quite disturbing, actually. <laughs> um, I can't describe why. Why would I find that so disturbing? I found it just this, this pure masculinity. So it was really... A, a, a combination of things. Um, let me think, how, how did I get to Picasso and his muses? I think I happened to, around that time, just randomly see an article in The Guardian or something about Dora Maar um, and going a little bit into her life story and, and also the story of Dora Maar and Marie Therese. Um, fighting in front of Guernica over this man, Pablo Picasso. And I found this story so fascinating somehow, you know, this, this man in the middle, um, so passive and, and who actually, in one way, so, so powerful, but also so passive. Um, I think he said about that experience, it was the choicest experience of his life. Yeah. Yeah. Watching these two women fight over him. And I thought, oh my goodness, you know, this, this indecisive, this nurse, narcissistic trait really and it, it but instead of focusing on him it just then made me more and more interested in these women and the more you read about one then you read about the next one then the next one. I mean he had so many muses some painters of one or two Picasso had god knows you know so many <laughs> um so yeah that's that's how I came long story condensed how, how I came to the muses and it's it's kind of followed me ever since I mean I do take breaks and write about other things um but it always comes back in some shape and form, you know? They are really captivating. I think I came not exactly the same route, but um, a similar route. And I remember someone tell me like at a party or something, the story about mm -hmm. Picasso and the two women fighting over Guer Guernica. Um, yeah. And I just like stuck, that memory has like really stuck in my mind, like that image. And obviously there's no images of it. There's no paintings of it, nothing like that. It's just yeah. a, an excerpt of a story that he's told um and then i was in malaga and i went to the picasso museum museum there <clears throat> there was an exhibition of surrealist artists women artists mm -hmm. and i saw a painting it was a painting by dora mar and i was like her painting looked exactly like a picasso painting yeah and i realized afterwards like that dora was actually a photographer and put a picture into the mm -hmm. um I'll share a picture in a wee while, but, um, and that he had basically made her paint. He, like, not forced her, but manipulated her into painting because he was not a skilled photographer. Okay. So if she was doing the same medium or working the same medium as him, he would always be superior to her. He couldn't, yeah, of course. He couldn't bear the thought of a woman that he was associated with being more skilled or talented than him and i mean some some her her paintings are genuinely very very good yeah you know, it's um that's the thing she was extremely talented but she's not remembered she's been remembered now in um there was a retrospective of all of her work in the in the tate and tate modern in london but mm -hmm. i think she was just basically even in her lifetime was just forgotten yeah. She was so successful. And it's so interesting that someone can be portrayed so many times in such like she's such a her the image of the weeping woman is such a popular image. Well Picasso Picasso portrayed her a lot as, you know, like as a very tortured, jagged person, didn't he? You know, yeah. and, and 
almost broken, you know. Um, whereas other reports from the time remember her as very dignified and controlled yeah. and, um, you know, he, he did seem to have this knack of, which is quite ironic for a cubist, um, to, of portraying his muses quite one dimensionally, you know, I mean, Dora Maar was kind of the, the tortured one. Um, yeah, we can actually, we'll put up the pictures. Yeah. Um, so, will, will we start in Dora Maar then, seeing as we're talking about her? So, yeah, and then we can start with her. So, this is the picture of the weeping woman that um, was used yeah. by Picasso. So it's like really jagged and acidic colors. Yeah, I mean, exactly. And I mean, it, the initial paintings of her were slightly different where she still had a certain, she still had the power, I think, what, in the relationship when he was pursuing her, you know? Um, but and the story of her taking a little knife and sticking it between her fingers on the table. Yeah. I love um, that story. Yeah, so, you know, he, she obviously, through love to this man, gave up large parts of herself and, and became very tortured, uh, or at least that's how he paints her. That, that's not necessarily the truth. Um, this, well, this is one of her photographs, actually. So that photograph is um, uh, one of the ones she did when she was working as a surrealist. Mm -hmm. So she would have done lots of collages and mm -hmm. stuff. The, everything was quite because it was surrealism very dreamlike and a bit uncanny yeah. and she was very she was a very successful um commercial photographer as well mm -hmm. but um that was all put to a stop <laughs> she met picasso yeah <laughs> yeah it's like it was really interesting going to the retrospective because she had there's rooms and rooms and rooms of all of her photographs and then um like go all the different things that she went through and she was quite like ahead of her time in a lot of ways and like mm -hmm. you, it, technically she was extremely developed and very um like she was very very skilled and also quite creative and mm -hmm. then you got to the bit where you, there's a point where she meets the castle that you can almost tell like things grind to a stop and yeah. she was painting i'll show you the the conversation which is the inspiration <clears throat> kind of or it's like the the image for our um, our collection. Mm -hmm. So that's Dora Mar sitting with Marie Therese Walter, Walter, isn't it? Having a so the back to back. Yeah. So I think I I think this one is really. It's a really beautiful image. Yeah. But you can see like the influence of her style and things mm -hmm. like that. It's very. It's not. But the thing is, it's not completely Picasso either yeah like she has her own style as a painter very much so you know i i do wonder why she painted marie therese front on and her back um mm. but we'll never know i guess yeah um yeah and i mean marie, marie therese was obviously picasso's neoclassical muse she was painted kind of quite often as a mother or a victim or um quite a lot of the times in pastel tones i mean in this one you know depending on what way you look at her head it can be a phallic symbol it can be a broken heart it could be a split in something and you know maybe maybe there's i think um picasso when he was painting these women obviously you know he possibly he was painting his he was painting his perception of them and i wonder was that the point when she stopped being his goddess and became the doormat instead. He he often talked about women being goddesses or, or doormats. And I wonder if this idea of the split, also like girl in front of a mirror and stuff, if, if that was really the point where maybe he was seeing Dora Mar already or, mm. you know, who, who knows? Um, it, it is interesting the way that he 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 seems to and like create a, a transformation in all of these women. So yeah. Mary Therese was very young. When he met her, I think sixteen or seventeen, wasn't she? Yeah. When what was the was... story that like she was like coming out of a subway station? Was that that was her? And yeah, he, I mean, there's uh, something like that. I mean, there's rumors that he met her even younger, but it wasn't official, and no one's. But that's just rumors, you know. So it's not something I just put out there as fact. Um, yeah. 
So, and I mean, she really, even, even years later, when, even when he was with Dora or with Francoise Chalot, he still kept contact to Marie Therese, you know, he still called her his Nina. Um, so there was obviously almost like a father daughter affection there. Um, yeah, it was, I think, I think it was her, she seems to have been like an exploration in womanhood, like yeah. all, all the, the, the paintings are so curvaceous and soft and she had a child quite young to him as well. Did, did, yeah. she, did she have one or two children? Did she have two? Oh, I honestly cannot remember. I think two, I think two. Um, a, boy, a boy and a girl, was it Claude and Paloma? I'm not 100% sure. <laughs> we should have the family trio memory. Yeah. <laughs> but there were so many children and so many, because there were so many partners or so many different wives and like different levels. But I think, mm -hmm. I definitely think that, so you have that transformation from child to woman to mother mm -hmm. with Marie Therese and then with Dora, it's like it's something different. It's like he broke her. He wanted to break her down. It's like she came fully formed. She was, I think she was in her thirties when she met him. Yeah, I mean, she, she was like this sharp, classy, elegant yeah. artist, you know, and, and a challenge for him, you and know? He, he destroyed her. Like he yeah. broke her down and she never really recovered. I think she, she must have gotten herself back in some way, but she never, I don't think she ever really stopped loving him and she never really, mm. she had a massive breakdown after they, they split up as well. And then she was in therapy with uh, Lacan. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> and all this stuff. Um, but she started, then she got back, she painted towards the end of her life. Well, but, um, she she became quite um, devout towards the end of her life too, yeah. didn't she? Quite, you know, she kind of, um, I don't know, almost the opposite of Picasso, who who was an atheist. You know, she she became completely devoted to religion. Um, maybe maybe that was her way of reinventing herself. Yeah, or yeah. like I feel like because she worships Picasso in his way, she needed to find another god. Well, exactly. Was it? What, did Picasso not himself one day say, I don't know in relation to what, but did he not say something like after Picasso, only God? Yeah. He did, didn't he? Which and and that, totally <laughs> makes sense from a narcissist. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, you know, I suppose for Dora Maar, after Picasso, there was only God, you know? And that's the way, uh, way it happened. Like, hmm. I, there's stories about like towards the end of her life, she just like, because she was, I think she was just like set off at sea like she was never she never really recovered and she had all these she kept up all, all of her pictures her photographs underneath her bed and then towards the end of her life she was selling them off gosh and she had all these Picasso like portraits of Picasso and all this stuff that was just hidden like she never mm -hmm. tried but um I think my favorite one is Francoise in a way yeah she, she i'll show the picture of her she she never got she never got broken down completely no she 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 broke the mold really didn't she she yeah. was the the free spirit the one he couldn't quite capture you know and um and she's so like she you can absolutely see why he was attracted to her because she's so captivating yeah she's incredibly beautiful and she was she was very young when she met him but she was an artist mm-hmm and I think she kind of went in with like a sense of knowledge that the others didn't. Yeah. Way. Yeah. I mean, he, she knew who he was as a man and um, she went in with her eyes fairly wide open, but she was also able to, despite having children with him, she was also strong enough in herself to be able to leave him when, um, you know, and she, obviously she wrote memoirs about life with him and, that drove Picasso absolutely yeah. crazy. Well, she, I mean. got, um, she got um, excommunicated basically because of that. This is, and we got like a, this is a portrait that she did it, did of herself. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, there, there was a time after that memoir was published that I think a lot of galleries in Paris wouldn't um, exhibit any of her work. And um, because Picasso obviously had feelers out without the, within the artist community to completely shun her. Yeah. Um, you can sort of understand why as well, because he had like, he had his image 
and that was so much part of him as an artist was like yeah having control of everything yeah. about himself and all these people around him worshiping him and like to have one of those women that he thought he could break do that to him must have been devastating but yeah well i think <laughs> you know i think you know obviously being the star he was you know and and um he you know he was surrounded by yes men and women who who didn't who didn't stand up to him or how he treated women in his life um you know so when when Francoise actually did that was a bit of a narcissistic collapse for him I, mm. <laughs> I agree so yeah because then Jacqueline Jacqueline Rock would have been his last wife and she did mad stuff like she closed the gates at his funeral and didn't let his children from previous partners visit him when he yeah. was dying. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I suppose her, you know, Francoise was really the free spirit and Jacqueline was the dutied wife at the end of the day, you know, she was yeah. protecting him as much as possible. Um, keeping, keeping him on his pedestal for the outside world. Yeah. Minding him, looking after him. Yeah. <laughs> And not challenging him it's yeah. i find like as well the paintings i don't have any paintings of jacqueline um because our our collection focuses on those three but mm -hmm. i think like the the paintings of jacqueline just don't have the same spice that the ones of um of dora and marie therese have yeah it is interesting though the paintings of, of francoise have a very specific I don't know. There's this painting. It's like he couldn't capture her. Yeah. No, he couldn't. And I mean, I think, um, you know, from what I've read as well, she did not like his paintings of her. She she kind of said, she said that, um, you know, he just paints what he sees, not the truth. And and she, I think, you know, the woman in green painting, she sold actually later in life. She didn't even keep it. She sold it on. Um, so um yeah and I, th I think also in the time with Francoise did he not have a phase where he switched to lithography rather yeah. than painting you know he he found it difficult to capture her and she refused to be captured uh, really so I, I think like a lot of a lot of the paintings seem like quite unfinished or like quite sketchy or like mm. of all of the things that he made of her were never really as evocative yeah like it, he could never have he didn't make anything like the weeping women but i'd wonder if that's because from marie therese and from from the different different muses he was like sucking from them like taking their energy and their life force yeah. and everything and then put using it to for his own purposes whereas with with um francoise maybe he just couldn't he couldn't take it yeah, I mean, who knows also, and, and with Francoise, I mean, while he was with her, he was painting other women as well. I mean, we don't know what the rela his relationship with them was, but for example, um, Silhouette with the high blonde ponytail that inspira inspired Brigitte Bardot. Um, you know, he, he had other muses too. Um, so he, and even though I don't think there was no relationship with Sylvette, that was, he may have tried, who knows, but she refused. That was very much a father daughter thing. Um, well, I think, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he says that. And then I don't know what he was thinking though. Yeah. So, you know, but she remembers him very fondly and, yeah. and, and that's, that's the funny thing, you know, um, she's a painter now as well. Like that's, she ended up, she was very young, but then he, she ended up as a professional painter. Yeah, she is south of England somewhere, I think. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, see, it's, it's it's interesting that that's how she ended up as well. So many of them are painters. Yeah. Well, I mean, Francoise Chalot's paintings are wonderful. She paints a lot of pictures about transition and open doors and windows. And, you know, she's a woman who's transitioned herself through many phases in life. And there's um, a great um, New Yorker, there's a New Yorker, New York Times article that she wrote fairly recently or was an interview with her and she's still like going strong and still yeah. really, like does not care. <laughs> yeah. And and I, I don't blame her, does not want to keep talking about Picasso. I mean, she's completely correct. She should, people should be talking about her work. She's also yeah. written, po she's also written poetry in the past. Um, there are 
rare books online I've been looking. I haven't managed to source one yet of published poems of hers, so which must be fascinating. Yeah, um, I think she must be. I would love to like go over and meet her, but she me too. <laughs> someday, someday. Um, <laughs> so back to the collection, I kind of want to talk about like yeah. what, we're, what we're doing with it because. Obviously, these three women existed and still do exist in Francoise's case. She's still alive. So um, I think with this kind of, of work that's written in the first person, there's a feeling that it's going to be some kind of like historical reenactment. But this is like absolutely not what we're going for at all. No, it's, it's very loosely based on some facts. I mean, both of us read a great deal of information while doing this and I mean I I don't know about your side but my bookshelves in the other room have about 30 books to do with the castle and this muse is like I just got these like three out for like whenever we were talking about it yeah I've got so many just big yeah. paintings and stuff exactly so you know I mean obviously we both read a lot and stuff but no it's not you know it's loosely based it's mm. um bringing our own voices in too. And, and we were talking about the archetypes there, you know, the victim, the this kind of tortured, controlled Dora, or going from control to being tortured, and, and then Francoise, the free spirit. You know, writing about these people, when you're writing about them, you realize that you're actually writing about pieces of yourself too. Yeah. You know, because we all have these different parts of us and we've all maybe had different roles and different relationships. So writing about these women and their stories, it also brings out yourself and maybe experiences you've had so it i feel it's it's loosely based on fact maybe like the crown on netflix you know <laughs> but yeah there's like i think it's like we, because the the pieces that we have been given through the paintings and different writings and stuff like that are quite fragmentary so what we've done mm -hmm. is we've taken things that we know and filled in the gaps mm -hmm. because the especially for Marie Therese and Dora, they're so, as you say, one dimensional. Yeah. We know there's so much underneath. So it's like, mm -hmm. there's an urge to just, you know, give a voice to that. So that's what we've done, exactly. I think. And I mean, with Dora and Francoise, I found it slightly, I think it's slightly easier to give them a voice because they did self-express in their own ways through photography, yeah. through painting, through poetry, etc. Um, with Marie Therese, it's slightly more difficult um, yeah. because there's really a part, there's second hand, third hand reports from family members of who she was as a person, etc. But there, there's very little of her own self expression anywhere to be able to. So it's really writing from a place of when you're trying to write in Marie Therese's voice. You're really remembering the times in your life where you played the victim or you were the victim in a relationship or something and writing from that feeling. Um, so, yeah, with with obviously true, as you say, like true facts sprinkled throughout. But it's it's really a, a collage yeah. that, we, that we've written. Um, and there are parts of the, the collection that we've written from first persons from our own experience. Yeah. I think it was kind of important within that to acknowledge mm -hmm. ourselves within the the collection that it isn't it isn't us writing the voices of yeah. these women so much as like uh, it's like it's like a chorus of all mm -hmm. these different voices, different parts of ourselves. It's, as you say, like a collage mm -hmm. of all these different things. And I think that the breaking of the fourth wall in it is is very important into the, the way that the book works. Well, that, that, that started, didn't it? Because I think um, we were quite rapid fire sending poems to each other in the voices of Dora Mar and Marie Therese. And then I think you had a day where you were not quite sure what to write about Dora Mar, and you just sent me back a poem in your own voice addressed to me. And it was just so brilliant, this complete, and it, and we kept going and then um, we got back to the muses, then got back to us com having a conversation with each other about the muses, about our own experiences. Um, yeah. So, you know, I, I thought that was a really, actually you initiated that breaking the fourth wall. I don't which, even remember. It's funny yeah. reading back the, back the collection because so many poems, I'm like, it doesn't, 
feel like I wrote them sometimes. It's like yeah. very strange. It's quite eerie almost. I'm not to get all like uh, superstitious on it or anything like that, but it, it honestly does feel like another person's voice at times. And it was yeah. very, there was like a real energy to making the work. Yeah, I, I think as well, you know, because when I read back of them, obviously some of them I was drawing loosely on maybe experiences I've had in relationships in the past. Um, and obviously writing so intensely about it, you kind of, you get back into that mindset and, and it becomes, there's elements of despair and passivity. And, and um, now with some distance to having written that, to go back in and read it again, it just feels like, oh my goodness, I'm in a completely different place emotionally now. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm Francoise now, <laughs> <laughs> or well, most of the time, but um, so it, it, it feels like going back in time, not just back a year to when we finished writing it but in some cases in my life going back 10 years 15 years etc so it was it was definitely a feeling of like mining our own experiences like some really uncomfortable experiences as well because yeah because of the subject matter it was very I don't know it made things feel close to hand that had been sort of pushed away a bit but also yeah. it's good to understand I think in those kind of moments that they feel so singular mm -hmm. and through the book and like looking at these women's experiences and the things that happen to them, it makes you understand that this is not a singular experience, it's a collective experience for mm -hmm. loads of women. Um, like maybe okay, we all, we don't all end up with Picasso. <laughs> would <laughs> would in that sense? Would would you want to, Emily? <laughs> Definitely. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> if it could be like uh, maybe temporarily, be a bit yeah. of a little bit. I think to be honest, like part of it as well is I went in kind of hating Picasso, yeah, and thinking he was a vile man in a lot of ways. But I've also like kind of developed. A tenderness towards him in a way after all this time and like well he was he was basically just a very very flawed man yeah. and uh, but you know that that also gives him a certain humanity yeah um you know this superstar painter was as weak and flawed as the rest of us um it's just a pity that his weak weak and flawedness was so violent towards other people yeah he did awful things like he put a cigarette out on dora mar's face oh gosh like and i'd say that was just something that was a one of of many who knows mm -hmm. what other stuff went on i think i think the unknowns of the story are so yeah i mean there 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 are various stories repeated in in several books i've read but they're 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 always positioned as um rumors rather mm -hmm. than facts so i'm even quite wary to repeat them on here because <laughs> you know who yeah. knows you don't like we don't know anything for sure because everything is reported like none mm -hmm. of it is recorded we don't have any facts like we have books and first-hand recollections from different people yeah. but that's the thing well like in in the same as with their own memories in the book the things we're writing, written, writing about are all very much from our perspective. I mean, one of the best stories I heard about Picasso was, I mean, this is not directly related to the muses, but he had a phase where um, he decided he wanted to be a poet. He wasn't going to paint anymore. He was just going to write poetry. And I think, you know, he was obviously good friends with Gertrude Stein and she invited him to one of her poetry evenings. And afterwards, she very kindly told him he should go back to painting as soon as possible. <laughs> You know, and story, stories like that kind of almost make him, <laughs> almost make him, feel, you feel sorry for him really. Yeah, but, like um a fallible person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love the stories about Gertrude Stein's salon. Whenever I was, I was in Paris last year, I was reading this book, really good book. I don't know if you've read it called No Modernism Without Lesbians. No. But, so it follows like four um, gay women at the turn of the last century. Um, most of them live in Paris because anybody who was anybody lived in Paris <laughs> then like anyone that was creative yeah, yeah. Um, but Gertrude Stein was one of them and I was just like he's <laughs> I have read like little bits of her poetry but I think my overall impression was that like 
she was a bit of a quack. Like she wrote these massive opuses that just like were almost unreadable, but had, <laughs> she was very similar to Picasso in that she had that personal energy where she gathered people to her and everybody respected her, even though mm-hmm. she, at times she seemed a bit ridiculous. Yeah. Well, I mean, admirable, admirable. I, you know, I, I can't, I, I personally, for me, I can't combine that kind of self-confidence with writing poetry. I know some people can, but I can't for me. <laughs> um, no. po- poetry is such a, uh, to me, poetry is a place where you mine yourself. It's such an introverted, solitary pursuit um, and this sort of exuberant self-confidence and salon nights and um, I don't know. I don't know if it makes for good poetry. I think... Yeah. I think like the crack that happens around being poet is good crack. I think poets are the best, mm-hmm. probably the best drinkers I know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, they, they've all got slight addiction problems. That some yeah. might be alcohol, some yeah. might be smoking. So you know. <laughs> but I think that the, I think there is a, definitely a bit of a separation between that and the reality of of making work. Like it is, yeah. it is a much more solitary, quiet. Thing. Mm. yeah <laughs> well i suppose i suppose we we finish books and then we've nothing to write about for a while so we go out and we live madly yeah so we've something else to write about for the next book <laughs> i do think that living i think that living as well as working is really important mm. like i don't know what i would write about if i didn't have like you've had lots of different lives i've had lots of different lives yeah yeah exactly uh, it's you know, and you need to keep having them. I, I, I always, I always think of my life a little bit like a, a tapestry. You know, it's nowhere yeah. near finished, but I hope that by the time I die, it's very colourful. <laughs> I feel like that as well. Like, like you need to go and have like a good adventure and yeah. meet new people and experience new things every so often. Yeah. You just, I don't know. I think some people do thrive on having a very rich internal life. Mm-hmm. I like to have a rich external life <laughs> that like feeds, but it just leads me on to the last year where we have none of us have had a very rich external life. Um, mm-hmm. So we were actually quite, we were very lucky that we were writing this just before lockdown happened. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when, when did we finish it? Did we finish it maybe April, May last year? Something like that. Like mm-hmm. we're, the first half of last year, but we were writing it pretty solidly from before COVID happened, from the autumn to winter before that. And then yeah. there are a few poems in there about Dora and Francois writing to each other and they're both planting yeah. seeds. And and, and, and I, I do remember in our external conversations to this, both of us were in lockdown making sour bread and planting lettuce and vegetables. And, yeah. and, and, and that did come through in, in the poems. We were both writing poems about these two women looking towards the future and planting seeds and baby lettuces, and, uh, which yeah, was really ourselves. But, the, the thing is, it was quite lucky for us as well that a lot of the, the works about those women are quite verdant and green. Mm-hmm. There was that greenhouse that Castle took them into. Yeah. There was a bit of synchronicity there. But definitely, I think around the, the time that we were like finishing up was like when the seeds started coming to fruition, all the, the literal seeds in our lives. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Quite nice now, actually, that our garden's starting to come back to life properly. Because it's been so miserable here. Well, it's, it's, it's been pretty awful here too. It's starting to get warm again now. So I, I did actually plant baby salads again this year yeah. <laughs> and um, they're almost done. So they, they're, they're actually finished far too early. Um, but anyway, we we'll see. <laughs> um, I wanted to talk about your, your next collection as well, because you've got, you've got one coming out. When is it, when is it actually coming out? Um, at this point, Emily, not 100% sure if it'll be September or October. Um, but it's going to be autumn this year. Um, also written in the last year. Um, it's called Brink, as in on the brink. And it's really about society on the verge. Um, you know, outside of Picasso's muses, I, I do write quite a lot of social critical poetry, I guess. And um, yeah, it's living here in Germany. Um, obviously, there's been... I know it's been a little bit the case in, in Ireland, especially in Dublin, but there have been 
an awful lot of protests here filled with conspiracy theories and QAnon, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and Bill Gates and reptilian overlords and microchips, etc. Um, and to the extent that it got to the point that the Reichstag in Berlin was stormed, which was basically a scene that would remind people of the Third Reich. Um, so that's been very disturbing over here in the last year, and it it kind of forced me to sit down and put pen to paper about that. And but then also digging into the Third Reich. Um, and really, the book is about propaganda, um, then and now. So that's the base of it. <laughs> it sounds really interesting. I'm really looking forward to reading it. Yeah. Um, and I've asked you to read a poem from it. Yeah. It? Do, you, do you want it now? Yeah. Do you want to read that now? And yeah. Um, in your video. OK, well, I'll read a poem called Smuggling Apples, Emily. It's, it's basically, um, this is the inspiration for the title um, cover of the book, which is a Klimt painting that was destroyed by the Nazis. Um, so this is called Smuggling Apples. Um, it's about Irina Sendlerova, um, who was a nurse who saved children from the Warsaw, Warsaw ghettos. Smuggling Apples. Picture this beside jurisprudence. Klimt's golden apples is engulfed. When the SS detonate a castle full of plunder as they flee, Schloss Immendorf and you and I, transported, cast a final look at the canvas bearing witness. Under branches, we'd hope to find Hesperia Arethusa, the dancing nymphs and maids guarding jewels while they sing among the green and gold in flames. Here, I digress to talk about an apple tree, a secret backyard, deep in Warsaw buried in the tomb of night, a pickling jar. It could be unearthed, screwed tight with names and code addresses, listing over 2,000 children decades younger, now immortal. Let's speak of borders, foresight, prudence, how caging skies hold Eden under, under. And I'll reveal a Polish nurse, a simple woman with a garden, smuggling carts of tools and babies, piled linen sacks for the older children. She trains her dog to bark, to hide the cries from uniform. Teresa, Joram, Piotr, Michel, Katerina. So now we're back in Immendorf, watching the Klimts from years before collapse and blacken in the flames as jurisprudence falls asunder. No hundred-headed dragon, Ladron, just a huddled woman in the shadows with her tools, her drugs and sacks, passing guards at ghetto gates and for a moment, just a beat, Irina's caught but blind men shr shrug and let her pass, dog howling while she sings. Wow, that was beautiful. A few, a few little stutters there. I don't think I've read that poem out before, actually. What so. it, well, you, I think you read it beautifully, but, but. it's been so long since any of us did any live readings. I, know. <laughs> like, I don't know how how things are gonna go and we will have to like gain a whole new sense of confidence. <laughs> yeah, I mean I, I, I have no expectations for a real life book launch in autumn. You know, I'm I'm very much assuming it's going to be online. I think it might so. be like I think we might be it might be I think there will be real in life in life in life um book launches soon. I've, I've booked to do a, a, a reading on a beach later in the summer in September. Oh. I love I love the idea of a combination of real life and online because there yeah. is there is something about online that is a huge advantage. It, it's it's an equal playing field. You can you can switch in from anywhere. Um, yeah, I think that has been brilliant because like obviously you're in Germany and I'm mm -hmm. in Donegal, which is yeah. far away from many things in Wales. <laughs> And it has been wonderful being able to like attend like I did workshops for in in Galway 
and in Dublin and stuff like that. Yeah. And I think that's been great. And you're doing um, an online yeah well i'm i'm doing i'm doing my mfa at the moment which is all online anyway um with manchester metropolitan uni um but i've been able to i've been able to tune into launches and readings this year mm-hmm. that i wouldn't have been able to otherwise so that's especially living overseas i i do hope things get back to normal and real life um but I love this idea of a combination. I think I saw on Twitter magma poetry of thinking of doing this in the future, the combination of real life, but also online, which would yeah. be great. I think it's ideal. I think, um, yeah, I'm excited. I am excited to get to do all the, like just to see people and like have the chats. Well, it's, it's the glass of wine afterwards, isn't it? Oh, you know, when, when <laughs> <laughs> it's here, we, awful, but here, here, here we go again, the old addiction speaking, but <laughs> You know, it's it's when you get your reading done, and and it's just it's it's the relaxing afterwards and the glass of wine and chatting to people who know exactly what it's like to lose yourself in words for hours on end. Um, yeah. Because where I don't know about you, you maybe have more of a circle of writer friends around you. I do not. So. Um, well, not physically here, definitely. Well, yeah. my partner's a writer, but he doesn't like he doesn't like poetry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I I'm, I find it very refreshing to be around other writers because I, I I I suddenly feel like oh my goodness they understand me. No one else really understands yeah. how like how I can lose myself in a word document for six hours, just moving commas around. You know, <laughs> and it was, takes a special type of person, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, no. yeah, what is it? Is it is it is it OCD or I don't know? It's something pathological yeah <laughs> i don't know what but it is <laughs> um i think right we've got a couple of poems from the collection that we're going yeah. to read um and i actually have little pictures um <coughs> two photographs um do, would you like to i'm going to get your photograph up um would you like to explain what like these these are the two last poems from our collection yeah so this is the point at which we've gone through all the different lives and careers and worked through a lot of stuff through the collection about these women and about ourselves um and we're getting to Mary Therese's last address to Dora Maher mm-hmm. yeah well I mean obviously this is a point in the book where we definitely are so I was writing in Mary Therese's voice obviously, and um, this is a point where definitely diverges from the truth. I mean, as, as, we, as we know, Marie Therese killed herself. She never really recovered from Picasso. And um, so she, had a, she did have a tragic end. Um, and I think when I was writing this last poem in the voice of Marie Therese, I wanted somehow to rewrite it for her um, yeah. a little bit to, to give her a, a dignified ending, this you know, this woman standing, who you know, who loved him for so many years, but still her own person. And um, so I was rewriting history a little bit here, an attempt to give her some some shape of dignity in the end. Um, so this poem is called Dove Nineteen Thirty. Have you? Yeah. Of 1936. So this is this is Marie Therese, oh, this is Marie Therese standing on a beach by herself. The picture was taken much years earlier, but still I find this such a strong picture of her. So Dove 1936. Dora, I'm still 17 in my heart, blessed with my daughter and memories. I couldn't bear the small web that he left me, waiting for visits in La Rue La Beauté. As our tapestry unraveled thread by thread, Follard was kind and lent me his home, where I stayed with Maya until the start of the war, accompanied by Ambroise's many white doves. Pick kept writing and sent me decoupés in paper, doves with the monogram, MTP, the M drawn, two legs spread, the T a body and the P the head. Long after he met you, Dora, he still sent cards telling me how every birthday of mine was a birth inside himself. And I don't regret that all I did was love. 
nor the fact that I never stop, stopped waiting. But when I look at myself in a picture he took of me on the beach in a black bathing suit, I see my strong nose and determined jaw, athletic body tanned and muscular. I'm at peace, my hair is bleached white by the sun. I look like Helena of Troy. I'm alone in the photo, but free as a bird, holding a volleyball on the tips of my fingers. A Greek goddess with the world in her hand. That's the image of me I'd prefer to throw over. Okay. Mm, I love that um, idea of setting her free at the end. Yeah. Hmm. Um, so I'm going to finish on a, a poem from the perspective of Dora Maher. Um, I'd like to say thank you so much, Joe, for joining me. It's really it's, wonderful. It's been an absolute pleasure. You know, I, I, I'm so excited about finally meeting you in person, Emily. <laughs> yes, we will do it. And I think yes. it will be really nice. And we've, I, I, I'm so excited about this collection. I really, yeah. really love the work. And it's a really nice feeling to like have created something with someone else to be proud yeah. of. Um, exactly. I'd like to say as well, thank you to the RCC and Letter Kenny and especially to Jeremy for um, allowing me to do this residency and to talk to these people um, who I've had such great experiences with over the last year. Um, it's been wonderful to, to be able to chat like this um, and to have a platform to, to share our work. So yeah. this poem is, uh, <coughs> this poem is called La Plage. And I'm just going to put this picture of Dormar beside Picasso with his back turned, which I think is almost a bit like the conversation, mm -hmm. um, the conversation painting that we're focused on, but Picasso is, has finally turned his back on, on Dora. So this is La Plage. I keep revisiting the beach in my mind. The sand reminds me of him, how warm and soft it was how it gathered under the table when we sat down in the evening to drink wine with our friends. I used to feel young on those days, reading under a parasol, him always shifting around, making temporary artworks, millions washed away by the tides. When I go now on my own, I never swim. Something stops me, even though I am truly free. As you realize, Marie Therese, you never really were. There's something about living on, the days adding distance. I always wanted to be alone as a child, to be able to close my bedroom door to the world, to my parents, to everyone. And now that I have managed it, the quietness around me expands. It is no longer two dimensional, it fills the time. Each day it grows larger, I get further away from the beach. The memories have revealed themselves as transient, smaller with each passing year. The photographs are fading under my bed. The parasol is long destroyed by winds or careless hands. My skin no longer tans, but I can feel the warmth of the sun. As I drink my coffee on the balcony, he is dead, Mary Therese, he is dead. What a powerful ending, Emily. <laughs> Thank you.